OK, chapters 9 to 12. Question 1. Why do you think Captain Wentworth's removing Walter from Anne makes her perfectly speechless? Uh, so this is when uh, everybody is, well, not everybody, Anne and Captain Wentworth and the young Charles Musgrove, the little kid, uh, and a relative, named, a small kid named Walter, are alone at Upper Cross Cottage. Uh, everyone else has gone out. So let's take a look at that. Uh, let's see. Uh, so Anne is taking care of young Charles, who is sick. Uh, starting here, this sentence uh, is referring to Walter. He could only have some play, and as his aunt would not let him tease his sick brother, he began to fasten himself upon her as she knelt. Uh, so Anne is kneeling. I think uh, young Charles is on the couch or something or on the bed. So she's kneeling by him and Walter fastens himself upon her, which means he grabs her. Uh, in such a way. That busy as she was about Charles, she could not shake him off. She spoke to him, ordered, entreated, entreated means asks sincerely. And insisted in vain, so it was unsuccessful. Uh, once she did contrive to push him away, which means at one point she did successfully push him away. But the boy had the greater pleasure in getting upon her back again directly, so she pushes him away, but immediately he grabs onto her back. Walter said she get down this moment. You are extremely troublesome. I am very angry with you. Uh, Walter cried Charles Hayter. So this is, uh, if you remember, this is uh, Henrietta's uh, fiance, the, the man that Henrietta Musgrove wants to marry. Uh, he is currently not part of the family. I think that's important to remember. Uh, and the word cry here doesn't mean like tears. Uh, cry here means shout. And not, not always loud. Uh, what it really means is uh, it's an outburst of emotion. So it's not like the careful, socially considered uh, kind of speaking. It's kind of more direct, more emotional kind of speaking. Walter cried Charles Hayter. Why do you not do as your bid? Bid here means told. So why don't you do what people tell you to do? Do not you hear your aunt speak? Come to me, Walter. Come to cousin Charles. But not a bit did Walter stir. Stir here means move. So Walter didn't pay any attention to him. OK, here's the scene. In another moment, however, she found herself in the state of being released from him. Someone was taking him from her, though he had bent down her head so much that his little sturdy hands were unfastened from around her neck. So this tells us that uh, he had bent down her head, so he's not just grabbing onto Anne's back. Uh, uh, because yes. remember, Anne is kneeling, so by grabbing onto Anne's back, he's also like kind of heavy and he's weighing her down and she can't even lift her head. So it's not just being annoying, it's actually kind of serious. Uh, but someone removes Walter from her and his little sturdy, which means strong, hands were unfastened from around her neck. Wow, so he was grabbing her neck. And he was resolutely borne away. Resolutely means uh, entirely, completely carried away. Before she knew that Captain Wentworth had done it. Ah, OK, so the person who removes Walter from Anne is Captain Wentworth. Her continuing her sensations her feelings on the discovery made her perfectly speechless. She could not even thank him. She could only hang over little sick Charles with most disordered feelings. Ah, so her feelings, her emotions are disordered. They're troubled. She doesn't quite know what to feel. Uh, why? And that's why uh, she's speechless. She doesn't know what she should be feeling. 
so she doesn't know what she should or could say. So the question now becomes why is uh, her emotions so disordered, so complicated? And the novel proceeds to tell us why. His kindness, Captain Wentworth's kindness, in stepping forward to her relief, the manner, which means the way that he did this, the silence in which it had passed, which means he did this without saying anything. Uh, notice that even Charles Hayter first tries to use words to convince Walter to leave Anne, but it's only Captain Wentworth who actually does anything, and he does it without saying anything first. Uh, this is not exactly polite. First of all, remember that Captain Wentworth uh, is not a part of the family at all. The only reason that he is at Uppercross is because uh, he's staying with his brother-in-law, the Admiral Croft, and his sister, Mrs. Croft, and he enjoys visiting Uppercross, which is uh, Uppercross is located on the same land as Kellynch. Uh, so it's in the same area. So he's really a visitor. He's not family. Uh, compared to Charles Hayter, who is also not family, but at least he's going to be married. So he's almost family. Uh, the social relationships here uh, suggest that it should be Charles Hayter who takes care of the situation because he is closest to family. But in fact, it's Captain Wentworth who actually does something. And he does this without first saying anything, so it's not exactly polite. It's uh, kind of too too familiar. Uh, familiar. The word familiar today means like you you know it, you recognize it. Uh, but remember, the original meaning is it has to do with family. Familiar means uh, too close, as if they were family. So Captain Wentworth isn't family, but he behaves like it. Um, and the reason that he does this, the novel calls the little particulars of the circumstance, which means the details of the situation. Uh, the details are that Captain Wentworth used to be engaged to Anne. Um, and I don't know if you've had this experience, but often when we used to be close to someone uh, and then later we drift farther apart, uh, often when we when we uh, interact or talk with them, we still have the memory of that cl earlier closer relationship. And so even though now uh, we're no longer so close, uh, sometimes we may uh, accidentally behave as if we were still close. Uh, and even though it's not entirely polite, sometimes it happens. Uh, so this, I think, is what happens here. Captain Wentworth, seeing that there is uh, some emergency in the situation because Anne is being weighed down uh, by Walter, uh, she has trouble lifting her head, he feels the need to behave quickly, to, to help solve the problem quickly. So even though he should have said something, he doesn't, and the fact that he doesn't say something uh, reminds Anne of why he thinks that he can do this uh, so directly. And the reason, of course, is because they used to be engaged. So the entire situation reminds Anne of the awkward current situation between herself and Captain Wentworth. Uh, so that's one part of it. But there's also the other part, which is how Captain Wentworth himself uh, sees the situation. Uh, so let's continue. With the conviction soon forced on her by the noise he was studiously making with the child that he meant to avoid hearing her thanks. OK, so uh, let's talk about this. So after he removes Walter from Anne, he makes a lot of noise with the child, so like he's he's fussing over the child. He's like uh, telling uh, Walter like no, not to do that, like talking to him or like patting him or something. He's making a lot of noise, and the fact that he's making so much noise is kind of unusual 
So Anne quite reasonably thinks that uh, Captain Wentworth is only making so much noise to avoid hearing her thanks. So he doesn't want to hear her uh, say thank you for doing this. Uh, let's continue. And rather sought to testify that her conversation was the last of his wants. So the fact that he's making so much noise that he doesn't seem to want to hear her say thank you tells her that he doesn't want to talk to her. Her conversation was the last of his wants. Wants here means something that he wants. Uh, so the last thing that he wants is to talk to her. Uh, and the only reasonable reason, the only likely reason is because he is also embarrassed. And the only reason he is embarrassed is because of the same reason that Anne is embarrassed. Maybe he didn't realize what he was doing until he finished. Uh, and now he realizes that he has reminded uh, both himself and Anne of their previous engagement. And so now he's also embarrassed. He doesn't want to talk to, to Anne. He wants to pretend like he's very busy. So all of these details, right? The way that he does this, uh, first of all, the fact that he helps her, his kindness, the way that he does this, uh, the fact that he doesn't talk beforehand, and their history, their past history, and the fact that he doesn't want to talk to her afterwards, all of these put together, uh, continuing here, produced such a confusion of varying but very painful agitation. So when she thinks about all of this, this produces confusion uh, and it makes her agitated here uh, means it gives her powerful emotions. And these emotions are painful uh, for the reasons we were just talking about. And they were so powerful and so painful and so confusing as she could not recover from them uh, till enabled by the entrance of Mary and the Miss Musgroves, so Henrietta and Louisa, to make over her little patient to their cares and leave the room. So uh, imagine this scene. Uh, Charles Hayter in, uh, is in the room somewhere. Anne is kneeling by the, the couch or the bed. Captain Wentworth is uh, somewhere else in the room, noisily fussing over Walter, and everybody is just kind of stuck there, very embarrassed, until Mary and Henrietta and Louisa come home, take over uh, young Charles, taking care of young Charles, and therefore now that Anne has no more duty in this room, she can leave the room. So she's confused all the way until she is able to leave the room. That's the first question. Uh, the reason Captain Wentworth removing Walter from Anne makes her perfectly speechless is because the way that he does this reminds both of them of their past history together. OK, moving on. Next question. Uh, let's see if. No, OK, next question. Uh, Louisa says that Mary has a great deal too much of the Elliot pride. Do you agree? Why or why not? If so, can you give some examples? Uh, OK, so let's go to page 59. Uh, let's see. OK, here we go. Uh, Louisa is talking to Captain Wentworth. Here, Louisa spoke again. Mary is good natured enough in many respects, said she. So. Uh, in many uh, places or in many ways, Mary is not too bad, like she's a good person. But she does sometimes provoke me excessively. Provoke here means like make me angry or make me want to, to say something to her. Why? By her nonsense and her pride, the Elliot pride. She has a great deal too much of the Elliot pride. Uh, OK, so first let's talk about her nonsense. Uh, we saw last week that Mary loves to complain. 
whenever she is in a bad mood, she always complains about uh, she doesn't feel well, she feels sick. Um, nobody cares about her. She's always ignored. Uh, but as soon as her her mood improves, um, suddenly she's not sick anymore. Then she can join everyone in whatever activities that everyone else is doing. So uh, everyone can tell that she's not actually sick. Or uh, another way to say this is that she might feel that she is sick, but compared with actual uh, actually being sick, she's not really that sick. She just uh, exaggerating how bad she feels. So that's what Louisa calls her nonsense. What about her pride? Um, do we have examples of her pride? Uh, we do. Let's see. When they first arrive at the top of the hill during their walk. Um, let's see. Uh, OK, so let's start here. Uh, they arrive at the hill and uh, the hill separates uh, Upper Cross from Winthrop and Winthrop is where Charles Hayter lives. Uh, again, the man that is going to marry Henrietta. Uh, and so Mary standing at the top of this hill. Took the opportunity of looking scornfully around her. Scornfully means uh, with contempt, so she doesn't think very much of uh, the place of Winthrop or of Charles Hayter. So she looks scornfully around her and she says to Captain Wentworth, it is very unpleasant having such connections. Here connection means uh, to know somebody. So here she's talking about Charles Hayter. Uh, continuing. But I assure you, she says to Captain Wentworth, I have never been in the house above twice in my life. So for some reason, she doesn't like Charles Hayter very much and even feels uh, or thinks that people would uh, feel that um, visiting their house a lot would be a bad thing socially. Why is this? Uh, if you remember, Charles Hayter is First of all, he's not a noble. He's a, a common person. Secondly, he's not rich. He's not a gentleman. The only kind of uh, title or social importance that he has is that he's a deacon, like he's someone who is like a, a preacher in the Church of England. But he's not even like an actual preacher. He's a substitute preacher, like he just got out of uh, religious school and he's taking over for an older preacher. So it's not even his own church. Uh, so in terms of uh, social status, he has a very, very low social status. Uh, and so Mary says that it is unpleasant to know this kind of person or to be related, to have a relationship of some kind with this kind of low status person. And uh, she tries, she she thinks that everyone thinks this way. So she uh, tells Captain Wentworth that she rarely goes to visit the house, never more than twice in my life, to try to reassure him that uh, she is not such a low status person. So this is a very clear example of her pride. And it's also the Elliot pride, because if you remember Sir Walter Elliot, her father, also takes great pride in the fact that he has a high social standing. I uh, remember uh, the, in the first chapter we read that uh, the two things that he loved most uh, are his beauty and his social standing. So both uh, related to himself, he, that he thinks he is very beautiful and that he has he is a high noble, he's very important socially and that these two are related. It is because he is so important that he's beautiful, and it is because he is so beautiful that he is important. Uh, so this is the same kind of pride that Mary has here. Uh, OK, here, here's another example. Starting here. 
the brow of the hill, which means the top of the hill, where they remained was a cheerful spot. Louisa returned and Mary finding a comfortable seat for herself on the step of a stile. OK, so what is a stile? If you think of a fence, uh, a fence is made up of um, long planks of horizontal wood uh, connecting vertical wooden posts, Mujuang, and the posts, those are styles. So uh, Mary has sat down on the step of a style. So this is uh, not uh, just a post of wood. It's there's like a foundation at the bottom. It's slightly bigger and it gives her a place to sit. So she finds a comfortable seat and so she was very well satisfied so long as the others all stood about her. Ah, so she's only happy with the this seat if everyone else around her is standing. Uh, so it, it means that she feels that she is more important than most of these people, so she deserves to sit first. Continuing, but when Louisa drew Captain Wentworth away to try for a gleaning of nuts in an adjoining hedgerow, gleaning here means picking, to pick from wild trees. Uh, or here a wild hedge, I guess. I moved home. So when Louisa drew Wentworth away and they were gone by degrees, which means gradually, quite out of sight and sound, so they leave slowly. Mary was happy no longer. She quarreled with her own seat. Quarrel means argue. Now, of course, Mary isn't actually arguing with her seat. It means that she's like fussing over it, complaining about it, trying like acting like it's not very comfortable. Uh, worrying about it. So she quarrels with her own seat. She was sure Louisa had got a much better seat somewhere. And nothing could prevent her, uh, Mary, from going to look for a better also. So she's happy when she's the only person sitting, but when she thinks that someone else has found a better seat, she's no longer happy. And the way that she uh, presents her unhappiness is not simply to look for another seat, but to act like her own seat is no longer that good. Uh, again, it looks like she thinks she deserves the best seat. Uh, and for the same reasons we were just talking about above. So yeah, we can say that Ma Mary does have too much of the Elliot pride. Uh, OK, next question. Yeah, do we have comments? No. OK, and also what, like, what time is it? Hang on. I can't see the time. <gasps> OK, OK. Um, we're going to. 11, right, OK. Uh, OK, next question. Anne thinks that Captain Benwick is younger than I am, younger in feeling, if not in fact, younger as a man. Do you agree? Why or why not? Might there be someone who is older than Anne in this sense? Why or why not? OK, so what does this question mean? Uh, if you remember, Captain Benwick is, I believe, a bit older than Anne. Uh, so he is not actually younger than Anne is. But he is younger in feeling, uh, younger as a man. Let's look at these two parts together. Feeling means emotion. What kind of emotion? As a man. Uh, so here it, it's not talking about like the emotions of men. Uh, mentioning men uh, also includes women. So younger as a man means younger as a man when relating to women. So. Here, the feelings that she's talking about are romantic feelings, social interactions with people of the opposite gender. In other words, she's saying that Captain Benwick is not as experienced in romantic situations or in so-called 
matters of the heart as she herself is. Uh, let's see if if that's true. What page is this? Uh, 65. OK, let's see, where is this? Uh, OK, uh, so. I'm not going to read all of this, but the point is that uh, Captain Benwick is sad because uh, he was engaged to Fanny Harville, but Fanny died. So before he was able to marry his wife, he lost his wife. And now he's staying with Fanny's brother, Captain Harville and Captain Harville's wife, and they treat him like a brother uh, because, you know, he's grieving uh, and they, he was about to be married to uh, Captain Harville's sister. So he's very sad. Uh, she died like within the year. It wasn't too long ago. OK, starting here. And yet, said Anne to herself, as they now moved forward to meet the party, so someone is coming uh, over to them. Party means group of people. He has not, perhaps, a more sorrowing heart than I have. Uh, so I'm, I must be as much uh, sadder than he is. I cannot believe his prospects so blighted forever. Prospects means future, but here, of course, it's talking about marriage prospects, like his possible future marriage here, meaning like maybe to someone else. Uh, he is younger than I am. Uh, so that's why she cannot believe that he won't marry someone else. He's so much younger. There's so much more to his, longer uh, for him to live his life. Uh, he is younger than I am, younger in feeling, if not in fact, younger as a man. He will rally again and be happy with another. To rally means to gain strength, to come back. Uh, Taylor Swift says, I come back stronger than the 90s trend. That's what rally means. Um, uh, so here Anne is saying that she herself is sadder and has more sorrowful experience in terms of romantic relationships than Captain Benwick does. Let's compare. We just talked about Benwick. He lost his fiance before marrying her. She died, so she's not coming back. What about Anne? Nine years ago, Anne was forced to break up with her fiance, Captain Wentworth, by her family. So she still loved him. In fact, we can say quite safely now that she still loves him, but she had to break up with him because her family did not agree, and marriage is not simply between two people, it is between two families. Uh, so, and the way that she breaks up with him is not like, oh, my family says no, we can't be together. Uh, she basically tries her best to push him away from her. So she says something like, uh, if I remember correctly, she says something like, I no longer love you or something. Or like, I no longer think we should be married. Like pretending it's her own decision. Okay, but now, nine years later, Captain Wentworth is back in her life. And now the reason that she couldn't marry him because he is poor is no longer true. He's rich, so now she can marry him, except for the fact that she had pretended to him that she no longer loved him. It's all very awkward, so she loves him. She still loves him. We can tell that he still loves her or at least cares about her. There's no real reason why they shouldn't get married, except for the fact that she told him she wouldn't marry him. And he can't leave her life because he's not here for her. He's here for his brother. Uh, sorry, sister, uh, Mrs. Croft and her husband, Admiral Croft. Uh, so Anne doesn't even have a reason to tell him to go away. So on the one hand, you have Benwick who lost his fiance and will never get her back again. On the other hand, you have Anne who lost her fiance. And it seems like she can't get him back again either, but not because he's dead, but because 
of some like silly reason that they can't resolve. She can see him. She can talk to him. Captain Wentworth. She just can't be with him. And so every time she sees him, every time she talks to him, reminds her that she can't be with the man that she loves and who uh, loves her also. Who do you think is sadder? I think Anne, uh, her situation is worse, is more tragic. So yeah, uh, I would agree with this question. I mean, I wrote the question, of course I agree. Um, OK, but the second part, is there someone who is older than Anne emotionally, who has been through more uh, emotional in, uh, events in their life? Let's think about this. Sir Walter Elliot? No, he doesn't have an emotional life. He just likes himself. Elizabeth? No, she's just like her father. And she was never even married. Like Sir Walter was married for a time. Elizabeth has always been single. Who else? Mary, who married Charles Musgrove. Well, I mean, if we think about their uh, marriage, how they interact with each other, uh, it doesn't really seem like they discuss like deep emotions. It doesn't seem like there is really anything very, very painful in their marriage. One reason may be because Mary is so uh, self involved, which means she only cares about herself. So she can't really feel this kind of emotional pain uh, unless it happens to herself. On the other hand, Charles Musgrove also doesn't seem to like really passionately love his wife. Uh, he's often out hunting when he's at home. He sort of like very politely and indulgently talks to his wife uh, very patiently puts up with her nonsense. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be a lot of emotional uh, experience here. Also, uh, they live very close to their uh, to Mr and Mrs Musgrove, the grandparents. So if anything happens or if they need help, they can always go to Charles Musgrove's parents for help. Also not really like emotionally powerful uh, situation here. Who else? Captain Wentworth? Ah, um, well, I, I would say that Captain Wentworth is emotionally exactly as old as Anne. They've been through exactly the same kind of emotional situation together. No, not the same kind, the same situation. They've been through the exact same situation together. They are currently in the same situation together. Uh, and also uh, we will see later that maybe Captain Wentworth is also slightly blind uh, in terms of how he interacts with Louisa. We saw in this week's reading that um, he talks with her a lot. She likes him a lot. Uh, but and I forget whether it's this week or next week, we read that in fact he had no intention of of marrying Louisa at all. So he is unaware that his behavior toward Louisa makes her and people around them think that he is interested when in fact he is not. So I guess this part is something that maybe Anne understands a bit better than he does uh, in in terms of uh, emotional intelligence or uh, like emotional experience, romantic experience. Uh, OK, who else? Um, Admiral Croft and his wife, Mrs. Croft. The, this is interesting. We know uh, a few things about this couple. The first is that in every major decision, uh, Admiral Croft always asks his wife, it says it tells this to us uh, in the first few chapters when talking about um, renting from Sir Walter Elliot. It says that um, Admiral Croft always asked his wife when making this kind of big decision. This is kind of unusual for the time, as we saw from the example of Lady Elliot, 
women of the time were expected to only care about certain things or only uh, participate in making decisions about certain things. Things related to family or friends, social relationships, the house, taking care of the house and the people in the house. Um, but other things like how to spend money or political decisions or decisions about like uh, policy, major cha uh, changes, all uh, are the the responsibility of the man. So the fact that Admiral Croft includes his wife in these bigger decisions tells us that uh, first of all, they are more open minded, but secondly, they are really equals in their marriage. They really uh, do everything together. They really look at each other as equal partners. And to me, this is a kind of uh, maturity also emotional maturity to be able to see that the person you married is equal to yourself is exactly as important. No more, no less, even if they are of another gender. Well, of course, uh, the gender issue is not that big a deal today. Although uh, women are still today not seen as exactly equal as men, but for most things, uh, women are now allowed to do the same as men. So, for example, um, in the United in the United States, uh, women were not allowed to open a bank account without a man or to own a credit card until the 1950s or 1960s. Not 18, 19. 50s and 60s. Uh, so even up up to like 60 years ago, uh, if a woman was living by herself, she really couldn't do anything. She, she can't save money. She can't spend money. It's very hard for women uh, of an earlier time without a man in their life, even if the man is just like a father or a brother. So here, like the fact that Admiral Croft and Mrs. Croft are are behaving as equals in their marriage is, I think, very emotionally mature. There's also another example we can look at. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, ah, yes, here. No, 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 not this one. Um, this one, OK. Uh, so let's see. They are, the group is taking a walk. And they enjoy the good weather. They're at near the top of the hill. And Captain Wentworth says. What glorious weather for the Admiral and my sister. They meant to take a long drive this morning and drive, of course, doesn't mean using a motor car. It means to use a horse drawn carriage. Uh, OK, continuing. Perhaps we may hail them from some of these hills. To hail means to say hello. So like maybe from atop of these hills, we can see them below and we, we can call out to them. They talked of coming into this side of the country. I wonder whereabouts they will upset today. Uh, OK, so I wonder where they will upset today. Upset here doesn't mean feel bad. Upset here, uh, the word upset. If you look at the two parts of this word, upset means to overturn or to flip over. Uh, so here, Captain Wentworth is talking about, I wonder where their carriage will tip over today. I wonder where they will have their accident today. And apparently this is as surprising to Louisa, who he's talking to, uh, as it is to us like what do you mean like where what where will they have their accident today uh so wentworth continues in response to louisa's surprise oh it does happen very often i assure you <laughs> they often get into accidents but my sister makes nothing of it which means she doesn't care too much it's not she doesn't think it's that important she would as leave be tossed out as not as leave be means uh, she would rather. Uh, so she would rather be tossed out or not tossed out. It's all the same to her. 
So tossed out, of course, means when they flip over and someone gets tossed out the door of the carriage or the window. Or I guess it's the door, the door of the carriage. So they don't. Admiral and Mrs. Croft don't really care if they get into like a minor accident tipping over. Um, and the reason a carriage would tip over is because, you know, maybe they're turning too fast. Uh, we read earlier somewhere that um, Admiral Croft is not the best driver. Like he goes too fast, he takes turns too fast, and so it's easy for them to crash or to, to uh, tip over. But uh, Mrs. Croft doesn't care. It's it's her husband. It, this is the person that she married. Uh, so you know, if he's a bad driver, he's a bad driver. Like there's nothing wrong with that. If they get into a small accident now and then, every day, so be it. So they get into accidents. Nothing wrong with that. And what this shows is that uh, Mrs. Croft is also very emotionally intelligent in understanding and accepting the man that she married. She didn't marry someone and then keep wishing that he would become a different person. She made sure of who he was first and then married him. Or another way to say this is maybe earlier in their marriage, they've been married a long time, maybe earlier in their marriage, she hoped that he would get better at driving. But he doesn't. So uh, she has stopped worrying about that. She has stopped trying to change what cannot be changed. And that I think is also very emotionally mature. So uh, the question is if Admiral and Mrs. Croft are emotionally more mature or more experienced than Anne. And I would say th that the answer is yes, because uh, think about this. Anne and Captain Wentworth quite obviously want to get married. But what will their marriage look like? Like how will they interact with each other after they're married? I think the hope is that after many years they will end up like Admiral and Mrs. Croft, uh, treating each other as equals and not caring too much about the other person's faults uh, or shortcomings. So in that sense, since uh, Admiral and Mrs. Croft are the ideal for Anne and Captain Wentworth, um, they are more mature, emotionally mature. They are emotionally older than Anne and Captain Wentworth in this sense. Uh, OK, let's take a short break. I will keep recording during the break. So you still have to behave. I will keep recording um, and we will come back after uh, 10 minutes at um, 1110.
Hello, teacher. Uh, okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, let's see, we have some questions. Does Anne have the same feeling as Benwick? I'm not quite sure what this question means. Uh, they both feel like they have lost the person that they love. But the difference is that for Anne, the person that she loves is still in her life. She can see him, she can touch him, but they can't be together for a very silly reason. Um, so I guess you can say that they have similar feelings, uh, but for Benwick, he has lost his fiance forever. There's no hope of getting her back. Uh, but for Anne, it's more confusing because uh, Captain Wentworth is still there. And as long as the person is there, there is always hope for change. I guess. Uh, OK, and uh, Guohal, yes, I saw this. Uh, don't worry, I'm recording this and putting this on YouTube. So if uh, you know what, I'll respond here. Uh, You can always go back uh, to watch the parts that you missed. OK, let's continue. Question four. How would you describe Anne's understanding 
of the uses of poetry and prose. Do you agree? Why or why not? So uh, in Chinese, poetry is ringwen and prose is sanwen. So basically the two main kinds of literature. How are they used or how should they be used according to Anne? Let's see, 67, 68. Mm. Okay, so here Anne is chatting with Captain Benwick. Uh, remember, Benwick is still very sad. Um, he was evidently, which means judging by the evidence, judging by what Anne can see and tell, a young man of considerable taste in reading. Considerable means uh, good, good taste in reading. Though principally in poetry, so he mostly only reads poetry. And besides the persuasion of having given him at least an evening's indulgence in this discussion of subjects, uh, which his usual companions had probably no concern in. OK, this long sentence means. That she had already spent an entire evening. Talking with him about things that other people, his usual uh, friends and family probably would not be interested in. Uh, so indulgence means like to to uh, like. Uh, I guess reluctantly. Uh, accompany someone or to allow someone due to kindness. Uh, so it kind of t tells us that maybe this is not exactly what Anne wants to do, uh, talking with Captain Benwick, but she's being kind to him. Another word to pay attention to, persuasion. Now, persuasion usually, of course, means to convince someone of something, but persuasion has another meaning. It means a tendency, a habit, 一种倾向. Uh, so she has the persuasion of indulging him. She has the tendency to be kind enough to talk to him about things that people, most people would find boring. Uh, and so I guess the thing that he wants to talk about is reading. Continuing. She had the hope of being of real use to him in some suggestions as to the duty and benefit of struggling against affliction. So in this conversation with him, she hopes to be useful to him, of real use to him. Uh, how? By suggesting uh, some ideas about uh, the best way of struggling against affliction. Affliction usually means disease. Here it means his sadness, the, the matters of the heart that are making him so sad. So she hopes to give him some useful suggestions about why and the, the benefits of fighting against uh, heartbreak, of not letting heartbreak uh, consume you or to engulf you to not lose yourself in heartbreak. Uh, and even though she has this very important goal, uh, the, this hope had naturally grown out of their conversation. So remember when um, Admiral Croft and, Li and Mrs. Croft are going to visit Kellynch Hall for the first time, and they're going to have the meeting to discuss whether to rent the place, uh, and it, the novel tells us that Anne at first did not want to be at the meeting. So the way that she gets out of the meeting is that she naturally goes on her morning walk and simply stays away. Uh, here it's the same thing. She wants to do something, but she can only do it naturally from the conversation that they are having and not like suddenly bringing this into the conversation. Um, let's skip the next line starting here. 
having talked of poetry. And after the comma, it tells us what they talk about. The richness of the present age, so how powerful and, and uh, diverse the current poets are. This is in like um, late 1700s, early 1800s. Uh, and gone through a brief comparison of opinion as to the first rate poets. So now they're talking about who they think the best poets are. Trying to ascertain or to to make sure or to figure out whether Marmion or these are all poems, whether Marmion or the Lady of the Lake were to be preferred were better. Uh, so which of these two poems are better? And how ranked the Jower and the Bride of Abydos? So uh, and these two poems like how good are they? Uh, the novel tells us that these are poems by. Uh, Sir Walter Scott and Lord Byron. These are two important poets of the time, and in fact they are still important poets. Uh, they are still studied today. Um, OK, so they're talking about these poems. And moreover, they also talk about how the Jawa was to be pronounced. So this is quite funny. Um, at the time, just like today, poems were mostly read uh, from books. They were not like in classical times performed mostly. So when you see the name of this poem in a book, how do you pronounce it? It's a very weird spelling. Uh, I say jar. I don't know. I'm not sure. And apparently uh, Anne and Captain Benwick are not sure either. So this is also something they talk about. So uh, they talk about poetry uh, in the, the uh, when they talk about poetry, they talk about these things. And Benwick showed himself so intimately acquainted with all the tender songs of the one poet and all the impassioned descriptions of hopeless agony of the other. So in this conversation, in this discussion, uh, Anne finds that Captain Benwick is intimately acquainted, which means he is very familiar with the tenderest song, songs means poems, the tenderest songs of the one. So the one, the other means the former, the latter. And as the novel tells us, the former is Sir Walter Scott and the latter is Lord Byron. Uh, so uh, here the novel is telling us that uh, Walter Scott's poems are tender, which means like kind and loving. And Lord Byron's poems are full of passion, impassioned. And hopeless agony. So agony is like pain here. It means pain of the heart being heartbroken or like having a crush on someone, but they never love you back. It's hopeless. So Captain Benwick is familiar with the kindness and the hopelessness of these poems. Um, Benwick repeated with such tremulous feeling. Tremulous means like powerful, making you like unsteady, uh, shaking. Tremulous uh, is resembling the word. It's, it's related to the word tremble to slightly shake. Tremulous feeling. So he repeats the various lines which imaged a broken heart or a mind destroyed by wretchedness. So he, re he repeats the lines of poetry that talk about a broken heart or like a, a hopeless mind. Uh, so let's talk about this sentence. Imaged. Uh, the word image is not usually used like this. Uh, for example, when you write your uh, English compositions, uh, when you want to say xiang xiang as like a noun of something that you imagine, 
some people use uh, this word imaged. I imaged or you know, I thought of something. The correct word, the verb is to imagine something. So to use the word image as a verb um, means not just to think of something, but to have that very clear image yixiang, in your mind. Um, because of these poems or these lines of poetry. Uh, OK, next, what is a mind destroyed by wretchedness? To be wretched means to feel unworthy, having no value. Uh, and so this is the kind of feeling that a poet might have when they are rejected by their love or when they are ignored by their love. Their love doesn't even know that they exist that the poet exists. And so when the poet thinks about these things in their mind, the more they think, the sadder they get, uh, the crazier they get. So it this is a mind destroyed by wretchedness. So um, Captain Benwick is repeating these lines of poetry about being heartbroken and about feeling wretched. Uh, and in repeating these lines, he looked so entirely, which means completely, as if he meant to be understood. So in other words, he's saying these lines of poetry as if they were a kind of communication for him, as if he's trying to tell Anne something through these lines of poetry. What this means is that these lines of poetry seem to describe exactly what he is feeling at this moment. These lines of heartbreak and uh, wretchedness seem to describe how he feels right now. Um, so when Anne notices this, she ventured to hope. Venture means try or uh, like courageously like with some uh, fear to try to do something. But here it also means say to say something. She she like uh, hesitantly said something, carefully said something. So the following part of this sentence is what she says. She ventured to she says she hopes he did not always read only poetry. And to say that she thought it was the misfortune of poetry to be seldom safely enjoyed by those who enjoyed it completely. So why does she not want him to read only poetry? Because it is seldom safely enjoyed by those who enjoy it completely. So what what exactly does it mean to enjoy a poem safely? And what is dangerous about poetry? Uh, well, here, this entire part of the novel is talking about Benwick's emotions. So apparently, Anne thinks that it is dangerous for someone who feels as sad as Benwick does to read poems that are equally sad. As if, uh, uh, and the novel continues. And that this that she says that the strong feelings which alone could estimate or value or like appreciate uh, poetry truly were the very feelings which ought to taste it, but sparingly. Sparingly means rarely. Uh, so she's saying that to really appreciate, to really enjoy good poetry, you have to have strong feelings. But the fact that you have strong feelings about these poems means that you should not uh, read them so frequently. So again, the idea seems to be that uh, when you're feeling sad or when you're feeling some kind of powerful emotion, reading poems that uh, magnify or exaggerate or add to those powerful emotions could be dangerous. It could be too emotional. Um, you may 
find it easier to understand this if you think about the most common form of poetry today, songs, popular songs that you might hear on the radio or like a like a Taylor Swift song. If you're feeling sad and you listen to a really sad Taylor Swift song, you might feel so sad that you start crying. Uh, and at the time, remember we talked about the novel of sensation and the idea that correct feelings lead to correct behavior. So Anne seems to be saying that if um, you feel too sad or like too powerful emotions, your behavior will also be affected and will also be um, not polite or not correct. So powerful emotions can be dangerous in how they influence how we behave and therefore it influences our social relationships. Um, so because of this, she says, I hope you don't always read only poetry. Uh, so that's the first part of the question. That's how Anne understands the use of poetry to guide feelings. Uh, OK, so. Continuing. His looks showing him not pained, but pleased with his allusion to his situation. So the allusion to his situation. His situation is, of course, the fact that Fanny has died. Allusion here means to refer to, to, to gesture toward, to suggest. Uh, so the suggestion I think is here, strong feelings. Uh, so she doesn't say, oh, you feel these strong feelings because you're sad about Fanny having died. But when she mentions strong feelings, both of them know this is what she's talking about. So uh, when you when someone important has died, you can often are want to be uh, careful about how you talk about this to someone who is sad about this death. Some people you talk about it, they break down again. Um, now, that's not a bad thing today. We don't think that's a bad thing. That's a natural thing, right? It's natural to be sad when you remember uh, someone important to you who has died. But for the same reason that Anne thinks it is dangerous to read uh, emotional poetry when you yourself are emotional. It is also considered dangerous uh, to to be too emotional. So if when Anne talks about Benwick's strong emotions, Benwick breaks down and cries, Anne would think that she has hurt him by making him feel too powerful emotions and therefore leading him to behave and think inappropriately, incorrectly. Uh, but fortunately, uh, when she talks about this, his looks, which means his facial expressions, showed him not pained, so not even sadder, but pleased. Why pleased? I, I think maybe it's because um, Anne, or he thinks that this shows that Anne really does understand what he's feeling. So he's pleased that Anne truly understands his feelings. Uh, OK, so now that Anne doesn't have to worry about making him sadder, she was emboldened to go on. To be bold means to be courageous, to be brave. So, so this situation made her give her uh, gave her courage to continue. And feeling in herself the right of seniority of mind. So because as we talked about, she is older in terms of emotional intelligence. She feels that she has the right. The right to do what? the right to recommend uh, things to read. So this is something I think we should all remember today. Like when you like watch a really great TV show and you want to recommend it to your friends. Have you ever thought this question? What right do you have 
to recommend something to your friends? What right do you have to recommend that they spend their valuable time watching this thing which you don't know if they will like? You yourself like it, but you don't know if they will like it. And also, what right do you have to assume that they will like the same things that you like? What right do you have to assume to be so familiar with their personal taste uh, in TV shows? So th these are the things that Anne is thinking uh, before she recommends things for uh, Benwick to read. But uh, now that he doesn't seem too sad and because she does have more experience, she ventured again, tried bravely, carefully. Uh, of course, this word is related to adventure, an adventure motion to take risks, right? So she ventured to recommend a larger allowance of prose in his daily study. Allowance to allow, of course, means rinchu, to let someone do something um, which maybe before they were not allowed to do. Uh, but allowance re also refers to the thing that you let them do or the thing that you let them have. Uh, in today in modern English, the word allowance is usually used for the money that you give a child every day or every week, Ling Yong Chen. And this is because this is all the money that is allowed to the child in this day or in this week. Uh, but before money, allowance was usually used for like health, right? Nutrition. You are only allowed to eat this much meat today or this much candy today. Uh, so here, this sentence is when it says that she recommends a larger allowance of prose in his daily study. This is medical language. A doctor might say might recommend a larger allowance of meat in his daily meals in the, the food that he eats every day. It's the exact same language. So uh, in this way, uh, the novel, or at least Anne, seems to be telling us that reading good literature can improve the health of the mind. So not just of the body, but also of the mind. Or I should say, eating good food can improve the body, just like reading good literature can improve the mind. OK, so she recommends that he reads more prose, not so much poetry. And on being requested to particularize, which means to give more details, she mentioned such works of our best moralists. Moralist uh, today is not a good term. It means uh, someone who cares a lot about morals, Dalda. But at the time, it was a good term because people also cared a lot about having the correct morals of doing what society believes is the best thing to do. So works of our best moralists. Uh, what else does she recommend? Such collections of the finest letters. Uh, this is interesting. Why are letters good, healthy reading? Well, people write letters because they have something important to say. This is before email. Email is so convenient that often we, we send emails without having something important to say. But back then it took a lot of time and energy to, to, to and free time, free time to write letters to people you care about, and it takes time for letters to get there. Uh, so people would usually write letters uh, for things that are more important or things that they care about. Uh, so collections of the finest letters usually means letters where people are giving advice or talking about some kind of situation. What else does she recommend? Memoirs of characters of worth and suffering. So a memoir is like a biography, a short biography, lu, or autobiography, the story of one's own experiences. 
and so she only recommends memoirs by people of worth and suffering. This is interesting of worth, which means they're worthy people. OK, fine. Yeah, uh, many people think that you should only read the life stories of good people. I don't exactly agree. Uh, personally, I think if you read the life story of anyone, you can always learn something. We'll talk about that later. OK, characters of worth. What about characters of suffering? Uh, so there is the idea that um, you only grow after suffering through some kind of bad experience. Or another way to say this is that people usually want advice when they are suffering. And so advice from people who have suffered in the same way could be more valuable. So uh, a memoir of someone who has been through suffering would be more valuable than like a memoir by a celebrity today, like a movie star writes a memoir of his life. Not exactly very uh, healthy for the mind. It could be, uh, but it's less likely to be healthy than like the memoir of like Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so she recommends these good memoirs, moralists, letters, memoirs. Uh, and, and when it says works of our best moralists, usually this is talking about essays. So she recommends these works as occurred to her at the moment as calculated to rouse and fortify the mind by the highest precepts and the strongest examples of moral and religious endurances. So these are the works that she thinks of at the moment that she thinks can best rouse and fortify the mind. Rouse means to awaken. So it's like Captain Benwick is like still half asleep in his heartbreak. His mind is not clear, so she hopes to waken him. And fortify means to strengthen, to strengthen his mind against heartbreak. Now, how do these works do this? By the highest precepts. A precept usually refers to a moral precept. A moral precept is a moral idea. Things like uh, you shouldn't kill people or like uh, you should always try to help people. These are some common precepts. So the idea is that these works that she is recommending are full of these very clear moral statements and sentences. Like these authors somewhere in there all say something like you should do something or it is best to do something. And she believes that these kinds of words can best awaken and strengthen Benwick's mind. Um, so I think this is talking about the moralists. The moralists have high or good precepts. Uh, and maybe the letters too. Uh, but the memoirs have the strongest examples of moral and religious endurances. Uh, endurance, of course, means to withstand suffering, to endure suffering, to overcome, or sometimes just to survive suffering. So here, this is tying into memoirs of characters of worth and suffering. Uh, the works, the memoirs that she recommends have the strongest examples of surviving and learning from moral and religious suffering. Which means suffering because of their good morals and good religion. Uh, so it seems that Anne believes the use of prose is uh, as a kind of education, right? The author says something gives examples, explains things, uh, gives advice, and the reader is supposed to take it, to learn it, kind of like today when we're reading like a textbook. Um, so Anne understands poetry as guiding emotion and understands prose as teaching good morals. Uh, the second part of the question, question four, do you agree? Why or why not? Do I agree that these are the the 
uses, the main uses, or even the best uses of literature, or I guess poetry and prose? Not really. There are many, many, many uses of literature. Uh, let's talk about prose first, uh, because I think you're more familiar with prose uh, in the form of novels. We're reading a novel, but Anne doesn't mention fiction, which is very interesting. Uh, at the time, fiction was not seen as very important. Uh, in fact, it is Jane Austen herself, her works of fiction, that helped change people's minds about how and why fiction could be important. Uh, because she writes about the ordinary lives of these people so carefully that it seems to be full of these same kinds of messages and lessons that people want from uh, the usual popular prose essays and letters and things like that. So one thing that prose and fiction can do is of course teach us these good things right to give us good examples of good people but even when a story is full of bad people we can still learn from them right confucius said uh, in every three people at least one is my teacher right uh, including people who are inferior to me who are worse than me i can also learn from them so today if you watch a movie about like a serial killer or like a, a really bad person like that. And the movie doesn't have someone explain that killing people is wrong. You would still understand that it's wrong to kill people. Like we, the, the movie doesn't have to explain that. Uh, by watching someone in a movie kill many people, we can also see how uh, why it is wrong or bad, like the damage that it causes, the hurt and pain that it causes. You don't need someone to step out and tell tell us this. It's very clear. Or remember um, when we watched uh, Love and Friendship, right? The story of Lady Susan trying to find a new husband. It's very clear that she is a terrible person. We don't need someone to tell us that she's a terrible person in order to see that she's a terrible person. In fact, when characters do discuss the fact that she has a very bad reputation, it's not very clear that everyone believes this, right? Uh, the young man who she almost marries falls in love with her. He knows she has a bad reputation. Her, his family try to warn him, uh, but he doesn't believe them. So even in this movie, even when someone tells uh, us or a character that uh, this person is bad, it's not 100%. It's always within the framework of a story. A is telling B that someone is bad. It's not the, the film talking to us. That's my dog. Can you hear him or her? Can you hear my dog? Uh, she likes to bark a lot. Sorry about that. OK. Um, so that's one thing that we can use fiction for, for to also give us some bad examples. But also uh, you don't have to learn from what you read. You can read it to to uh, have fun, right? You, you, if you watch a, uh, an action movie, you don't have to learn from the action movie. I keep talking about movies. Movies are literature. Trust me, we're going to talk about this in weeks 16 and 17, I think. Um, so anyways, you don't have to learn from literature. You can just have fun. This is called uh, escapism to escape. Um, like your your uh, daily life or your uh, concerns in life. Escapism used to be a bad word. As you can see, people used to think that you had to learn from what you read and what you watch or what you hear. Uh, but today the the ideas have changed. Today, people agree that life is pretty hard. Uh, it, it's not a fun thing uh, to be alive most of the time. So we do need a way to relax and to uh, escape from our daily life once in a while. So that's also something that a literature can help you do. Um, 
you know what? Yeah, I'm talking about prose, but all of this also applies to poetry as well. Uh, poetry can also teach you by good examples, by bad examples. Poetry can also be fun. Uh, there are such things as fun poems, although I guess we don't read too many of those in the Department of Applied English. Um, we can also read literature for the language. OK, this is going to be a little bit philosophical, so bear with me. We think using language. When we think about something, the way that we think about it is to use words and sentences. So some people have argued that without language, we can't we find it harder to think about something. So for example, um, without the word feminism, it would be harder to think about all of the daily struggles that women face in society even today. You could still talk and think about the like uh, troubles and annoying things that women ha have to that one woman, right? Maybe your sister or your teacher or your mother has to deal with day after day. But at the end, it would simply be like one person's individual experience. Uh, and maybe if you like go across the world and you talk to women, most many women will have similar experiences. But the word feminism lets us put all of that into one word. Instead of saying the troubles and experiences that many women face around the world, you can now just say feminism. So it's easier for us to think about this problem, not just as individual problems, but as problems that most women face. And that pro as problems that women face because they are women. Uh, Something similar applies for like uh, gay people or like LGBT people. Before we had specific words for specific uh, kinds of sexual orientations or gender identities, um, it was hard to let straight people understand what you were talking about. Like a man who loves a man, that doesn't sound right. But if now that we have the language, we can say gay person. Uh, and when when we hear that word gay, we don't just think about men who love men or women who love women. There is an entire uh, image or you can say stereotype about gay people and their place in culture and like the kind of personalities that they have. All of that fits into the one word gay, and that's not something that we could do easily without this word. So the language that we use has a big effect on how we think. So when you read good literature, one thing that they could do is to give you new language, either new words or new ways of talking about something. Um, and so when you have these new words and new language, it can help you to have new ideas. And, it, and new ideas can lead to new possibilities in your life, new actions, new uh, kinds of future for you, for people. And this is very important. In fact, I think this is one of the most important reasons to read literature, because life changes. Nothing stays the same forever. So if you're happy now, that doesn't mean you will be happy in 10 minutes, 10 years. Um, there's no guarantee. So the best thing I think is to allow yourself to change along with life. And to change, you need possibilities of change. You need ways to change. And that's what literature can do. It can give you different futures, different possibilities, so that if life suddenly changes, maybe you will already be a little bit prepared. 
it won't be a complete surprise. Um, and poetry especially, because poetry is not really limited by grammar or like spelling. You can do lots of crazy language things with poetry. What else can you do with literature? What other uses of literature are there? Well, uh, you can teach literature, right? If you don't know literature, you can't teach literature. So that's one thing. Um, and then finally, there's one last thing I can think of that literature can help you do. It can help you find a community. It can help you find a sense of belonging. Um, of course, you can find a sense of community of a home away from home, people who have the same interests and uh, like the same things as you do in many things, not just literature. But for people who really love literature, their most important sense of belonging or community might come from other people who also love literature. So literature is also something that can bring people together into a community. OK, moving quickly. Uh, last question. Anne hopes that Louisa's accident will prompt Captain Wentworth to reconsider the absolute value of having firmness of character in terms of Anne versus Louisa. Do you think that such a comparison might make sense? Why or why not? Here's what I'm actually asking. Louisa gets into an accident because she keeps wanting to jump down into Captain Wentworth's arms. She's headstrong. Another way to say this is that she is firm in character. She gets what she wants. Nobody can change her mind. Now, Anne uh, broke up with Captain Wentworth in the same way. She told him it was her decision. He won't change her mind. And Captain Wentworth has previously said that this kind of firmness of character is what he most admires in a woman. He thinks this is the most important thing. So the question here is, and hopes that uh, when Captain Wentworth sees that Louisa got into her accident because nobody could change her mind, maybe Captain Wentworth will think that this is not the most important quality in a woman. And if he changes his mind about that, maybe he will no longer love her. Anne. And so if Captain Wentworth doesn't love Anne anymore, uh, then Anne doesn't have to worry about the awkward situation because even if she does love him, they won't get married. He don't will no longer love her. That's what she thinks. And that's what she hopes. Question, does that make sense? Uh, and I think no, because Anne broke up with Wentworth because her family would not let her marry. If she had eloped and ran away and married Wentworth anyway, they would still be poor, but they would also not have Anne's family. So it was a pretty good social decision, even if it broke both of their hearts. Louisa only wants to have fun in jumping down into Wentworth's arms. There's nothing really important about this. She just wants to enjoy herself. So even though both are firmness of character, they are firm for completely different reasons. So I don't think this comparison makes a lot of sense. It's more like fantasy, wishful thinking by Anne. OK, uh, we're almost out of time. So do you have questions? Uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask directly. And if you don't have questions, please go back to the main screen and uh, click here and click submit. Uh, this is attendance. So click here to let me know that you did come to class today. Oh, that's the end of the recording. I'll stop recording. <laughs>